All right, so we are recording. All right, so in, in a first for our Everson object conversations, uh, we are actually taping a conversation asynchronously. So uh, Karen and I were able to join Krista Saad earlier this morning. It is like 9 a.m. her time on the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. Um, so if you don't know Krista and her work, she was born and raised in Pittsburgh and she brings a sensibility about the Rust Belt and industry to her work. Uh, but she is uh, one of my very favorite functional potters and she's been on a very interesting uh, odyssey that led her to move to the Baja Peninsula with her uh, partner, Kevin. But uh, in any case, welcome Krista. Adia, hola, hola, I should say hello. <laughs> hi, Karen. Hi, hi, Krista. Krista and I have never met, so <laughs> exciting for me. So I art like, is... I feel like old friends already, to be honest. Yeah, no, really. <laughs> so art is always a great thing to bring people together. And I just wanted to say that uh, not only was I, through Karen, able to bring one of Krista's pieces into the Everson, but uh, previously when I was at Arizona State University, I worked with the gallerist uh, Jeffrey Spawn to bring in another of Krista's iron teapots into the collection at Arizona State. So I'm sort of the Johnny Appleseed of the iron teapot. <laughs> in the, in the you the are. <laughs> so uh, Krista, this is a piece that uh, um, you sold through, I believe, a gallery to uh, um, the Museum of Craft and Design, their gift ah, shop. OK. So that was the, the venue, the Museum of Craft and Design. And it entered Karen's collection and just last year uh, came to us at the Everson. And when we were looking at this piece earlier, I think you instantly flashed to sort of remembering creating this piece. And uh, you talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, not only is this piece, I think, one of your signatures when it comes to your pottery, but a large part of your world is teaching and demonstrating and going to different universities. And so I think the Iron Teapot series is also an interesting view into your sort of teaching and workshop practice. Can you talk a little bit about how bringing these in uh, to a workshop situation is, you know, valuable for, I guess, both the students and you? Thank you. Yes, yeah, Garth. Um, you know, when I was in graduate school at Indiana University, in Bloomington, I was teased for probably the entire three years about my obsession with making these iron shaped teapots. And I was mentioning a little earlier before we started the taping that I have not made that many since graduate school. I mean, I stopped after graduate school in, in the late 90s. I didn't make those pots because I couldn't afford to make those for sale. You know, they weren't a real affordable object. And yet I would be invited to teach around the country and people would say, what about the iron teapot? How do you make those? And I thought, wow, who has seen these and how did the word get out? But I think the interest became the fact that I made them on the wheel, creating round forms, objects all based on the circle and yet um, cut and built these more complicated kind of constructions. So I just, I labeled the, I gave a title sort of cut and construct or the wheel as a tool for ideas or uh, wheel thrown slab construction. That was another one. And I found that there was more of an interest in the process maybe than the product. And that drive um, the desire to sort of show others and educate about this process was the driving force to make another dozen or so of these teapots, which then I, I donated quite a few and um, collectors bought some here and there. There's a few in different museums, but it's an interesting piece to me that it's my signature. And yet one of the things I've probably made the fewest of, um, and also I've spent probably more time on them than anything so that you can't really calculate hours going into this or price, but the value really is in the, the learning, you know, that, that students can have a breakthrough realizing you can make something else from um, the wheel other than a round pot, you know, or a cup or a, a bowl, but something with many elements, just using your imagination. So 
Yeah, Roberto Lugo likes to talk about, you know, as a student discovering the potter's wheel and sort of instantly realizing that it's a tool for making round things as much as it is a potter's wheel. And the way that you're combining all of these compound forms, I think, is sort of that to the max. So the genesis of all of these conversations was actually a class that I taught at Syracuse University that was really a hardcore object study class. So when we weren't doing these sort of uh, online conversations, we could really gather around pieces and look at the details and talk about them. But it's great that I have this piece in front of me. Um, can you, so I, you know, I wanna say, uh, Pittsburgh and the Rust Belt and industry is a big part of who you are as an artist and I see all of these things that echo um, automobile design and I think of Cleveland and Victor Schreckengost and all of the amazing um, you know 1950s um, auto design that that he did. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the elements of this pot that might not be um, obvious to someone who's not a potter themselves. Well, you know, that, that spout is a telescoping effect, right? So I just, I love playing with these references, whether it's a camping cup that you collapse or a telescope that extends, that idea of how you can use um, the illusion of of something like that, that spout, just when I was looking at it, I was saying, what, did, what made me do that? But I remember thinking, oh, I love those metal cups you buy at a flea market that you, you know, you fold up. And so this just a little tool trick and, and I can create an illusion. I guess I'm even more interested to know why Karen would choose a pot like this, because as from the collector perspective, I've always wondered why, what people are drawn to that makes them say one teapot over another or, you know, there's so many, so many varieties of the imagination that come through clay. We see these flowery, loose, you know, frilly things, and then super structural, simple work. So it's just interesting. I'd love to know, Karen, what about this piece maybe even caught your eye? Well, first, <laughs> let's start with you actually identified the reason I collect teapots. It is that it allows me to have a unified collection that you know it's got a spout it's got a handle and yet enjoy pieces that run from the a tiny real Yixing teapot um purchased in china to your um iron teapot and even weirder okay <laughs> the specific reason i is, is i'm passionate about yours is a lot of the glaze effects. If you look at the, the front line down there and you can see the crystalline glaze, that little tiny segment that develop there and then turn it on its side and there are two like rivers of a <laughs> blue that's more intense than the blue that's surrounded. And what, what were the kiln conditions? What were the firing conditions that serendipitously created those streaks to appear and nowhere else. How, so, so you get into this contrast, and I love the contrast between what the kiln gods have done for and to that teapot with the control and precision suggested by your sharp edges and by the articulation and assemblage of all the elements. Um, and what you, you heard, Garth kind of allude to that. I am a formalist and everything I've said is about, you know, the, the form and, and what I see in front of me in a self-contained relationship with the piece. And I call myself a formalist. I knew we were connected. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's what makes me make those kinds of pieces is a love for the formal, um elements i guess you call it the the most basic and um strength strong form so i, I think we yeah, see it either <laughs> i love the 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 width the the heft of the handle and then of course the 
the particular glaze is uh, I happen to be a fool for Celadon. So this is very much in, you know, the Celadon uh, zone and the contrast of the, the metallic glaze at the front, which suggests, um, you know, a piece of, of aluminum or a metal piece rather than a clay piece. I mean, I just love everything about it and I could go on and on, but I, oh. I'm enjoying your comments. So well, I'm going to go ahead and share an image that I brought up from your website from a sister or brother teapot to uh, one of the ones that we were talking about earlier. Um, can you talk a little bit about you, you, the iron teapots almost made you double down on these Baroque industrial uh, forms that evoke rebar and um, you know other um, industrial materials and you're using them as canvases for kind of rust belt cityscapes or uh, industry scapes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the teapot as canvas? Wow, well, first I just have to say that Karen makes me feel so understood. And I have to say, it is so <laughs> rare to feel so understood. <laughs> Especially when I so misunderstood a minutes ago by my own family. But it's <laughs> wonderful to know that somebody that you don't know, you've never met, can look at your work and and pull so much information from it that's so exactly what was going on in my head. So that is, a, is just fantastic. Thank exciting. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, so you, I can't even express that quick enough in this short time how that touches me. But to be in your studio making things and think you don't even know who your audience is and if they'll understand it, you don't usually care that much. But to know that the, it's placed with somebody that really connected and understood and, and felt what I was feeling when I made it, that is a powerful connection. That, that's why we say the future of craft, right? I mean, we, this is important. Uh, so this, you know, these pieces, Garth, were a series that Leslie Farron of Farron Gallery encouraged me to explore um, back in about a decade ago, actually. She asked me if I could challenge myself to bring some imagery to my work that was personal and that told a story of my, my background, my upbringing. And so I really thought a lot about it and I thought, well, isn't it interesting that I'm from the steel city and yet I'm, I was born in 1970 and so all of the steel mills were really just closing down. And you know, what we saw was just a lot of the remnants. But upon further research of steel mills and, and active steel mills in, in like China, you find that the pollution is just ridiculous. I mean, it, it, it's, there's so much smoke and fog, you know, just this polluting kind of chemicals going into the air. So I started thinking, wow, maybe I could make some pieces that, that really show a little bit about this, this quiet beauty of industry that it's also sort of a horrifying part of um, what's happening to our environment. So these pieces are really meant to draw the viewer in um, to sort of seduce you to look closer and then realize that what you're looking at is really this sort of scene that we consider to be rather unattractive um, normally, you know, this industrial wasteland really. But um, I'm, I'm drawn to the fine line between beauty and, and I guess what we could call um, decay maybe or destruction, you know, these the things that sort of have a negative effect and impact on our, our environment and how we can find the beautiful moments within, uh, maybe you, you know, a little plant or a little bird or something. So my work doesn't maybe express the hopeful part as much as I'm talking about, I think, but I, I, it's like the solemn quiet. Why do I make a big grenade? Why do I make a quiet gas mask? Uh, the pieces I, I'm making right now an en enormous horse head wearing a gas mask. It's the beauty of the two coming together nature, man, and the planet all trying to coexist, you know? So this is sort of talking about, this is one of these pieces too, the ceremony of tea, but yet also, you know, while you're, you're sharing this pot together, maybe even just in the center of the table, you have this, these scenes of water being polluted by the industrial waste. So I've had a lot of people ask me here in Mexico, why do you make Granada? They say the Mexicans want to know what's the infatuation with grenades or gas masks or an ugly steel mill. I'm not obsessed with them. I'm trying to present them to people in a way that they are forced to contemplate a little bit more. Um, 
the beauty in, in the man-made, why we're so attracted to architecture, art, all the things made by human hands. Uh, but it's so easy to ignore the destruction, you know, that is the side effect, I guess. So I, I want people to think a little bit more about the planet. Um, and yet I'm not making work about that, that literally shows the planet in all of its beauty. I'm showing sort of the opposite side, how there's this quiet destruction happening all around and, and we're part of it. So just to think about it, I think, you know, I try not to lecture as much as just uh, give people a little focal point maybe for their own thoughts and meditation. So speaking of contrasts between sort of beauty and industry, I'm gonna bring up a uh, next slide and let you talk about the newest chapter of your life that you've opened up. Um, and can, can you tell us a little bit more about the studio that you and your partner, Kevin, just built and opened in uh, Baja in Mexico? Yes. Um, well, Kevin Wickham, he, he's a, a self-taught architect, I guess you could say architectural designer, more coming from the builder standpoint. And he's always worked with cast concrete, which is a very complex material. And so we had an opportunity. We found some land down here that was not expensive with an incredible view of the ocean and the mountains. And after I've taught, you know, workshops for the last 20, 25 years around the world, I thought this location is as fantastic as any I've been to, affordable, near the United States. And it also gave my partner an opportunity to build a project that he had always wanted to build. This was a, a design he had had in mind for years of his career, but no client was wild enough to kind of go out on this limb and build something. It's very triangular. I think you have a, an overhead shot we'll look at in a little bit, but the, the floor plan of this house is, it has almost no right angles. You know, there's a lot of sort of spaces that present maybe a challenge to your average decorator, but for us, it's everything we have is custom made. So we're trying to create a building here that is inspiring to artists, creators, makers of any kind, tourists even. Uh, people come to us really more and more to have a touch of culture. They, they're not sure what the culture is because Baja is a little bit like Mexico and, and United States blend. Um, the Baja Peninsula really does not feel like Mexico. So um, we're trying to create just something altogether unique and never seen before. An architect and a ceramic artist coming together and and anything's possible with this land. It's, it's like we've got resources around us and a lot of space. And so we invite artists in to join us to create here, whether through workshop or residency. You know, we're, we're new, we're only in our second year and we've had a few struggles thanks to COVID and other cancellations, but we're still working hard to build this dream and to share it. That's the main thing, to invite people to come in and share and be inspired by a lifestyle. <laughs> Really. And you give us a little panorama. You just tilted your computer uh, a little bit earlier and showed us the uh, kitchen space. And if you can just give us that look, that would be great. Well, the, of the indoor space or the outdoor space? This is going toward the glass, the oh. ocean. I think you can see. And um, the other way around, we've hung all of my own paintings too. And so it's featuring paintings, ceramics, kind of our dirty kitchen over there. Um, even some of my Zeppelins. We, we had the opportunity to, can you see those? To hang um, anything we want. And I really feel like, I mean, we were, this building is inspired by Tadao Ando. And so a lot of, if you've seen Ando's architecture before, it's just very sort of um, stoic, solemn, serious, concrete buildings. So this on the other hand is the student accommodation. It's not our building but we want to have a little Mexican style experience so that people don't come here and feel like they're in America, in Mexico. So we really blend in um, a lot of Mexican culture when we leave our own campus. So this is sort of a nearby campus where students are staying when they come to do workshops. We don't actually have accommodations on the premises yet. <laughs> You've got, got a great little casita for the artists and uh, I wanted to show this to encourage people to start thinking about travel and learning when the workshop world does finally open up again. That's right. We have a class in June of 2021, so time to plan. All right. So I actually have to wrap things up, but uh, do you have any final sort of connections or thoughts about um, what teapots as sort of a totem of the ceramics world um, have 
sort of brought to you and your career? You know, I really think Karen has, she's the perfect example of what it's brought to my career. A connection with the collector is, is such a unique, that's a unique relationship because these teapot, eccentric teapot making would not exist without collectors to give them these homes. Artists simply run out of space and enthusiasm when nobody buys their work. I know for myself, my teapot series dwindled when there wasn't an audience or a market. But when you meet somebody like Karen who has purchased the work, cared for the work, seen to its longevity and where it goes after, her lifespan even, that to me is, that's why we continue to make art. I mean, I, I, I know there's people that believe art exists in a vacuum, kind of artists in their studio, but no, for me, it, it's the relationship with people like you, Karen, and Garth, you, that, that's the three of us create energy together, I believe. All right, so uh, Krista, Karen, uh, we'll do a little toast with the uh, Iron Pot. Thank you for joining us today, Krista. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. This so it was lovely, lovely, lovely meeting you. Oh, yes. So happy to bring you together. I hope I you at Seek us sometime. I, we should all live and be well and party together at Enseca. Yay! <laughs> right, thank, thank you both. You. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I, I'm thinking of you all. Likewise. <laughs>